Okay, we're recording. Please go ahead. Super. It is it is October 10, 2024, and this is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 21, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. Uh, there is no in-person attendance. Uh, it's not possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that people can adequately uh, access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I'm going to call the meeting to order and see if everyone can hear us. Pat? Present. Pam is present. Jennifer? Um, I'm here. Um, Councillor Ette? Present. Uh, going through the faces, um, Councillor Mandy Jo Haneke? Present. Okay, we are here and accounted for. Uh, there are no public hearings tonight. There is a general public comment period. So public comments on the matter with of jurisdiction with, excuse me, on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. During the public comment period, the chair will recognize members. And when you're called on, please identify yourself with your full name and your district or address. And we typically do not engage in a dialogue during public comment period. I'm going to look to the attendees and see if there are any hands in the audience, anyone putting their hands up to give public comment. I see one. Can someone bring Martha Hanner in, please? <laughs> Hello, I'm Martha Hanner from District 5, speaking as an individual. Uh, good evening. And I just wanted to point out that the section that you're going to be reviewing tonight called the submittal requirements, uh, that section comes primarily from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's model solar bylaw. Uh, it came almost in its entirety with only some minor modifications. So uh, that was the source for that long list of the requirements, mainly. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Good luck with your um, reviewing tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak in the audience? I see no other hands. So we will move to our action items. And the first one on the agenda is the solar bylaw. Uh, I just wanted to remind folks that the version that we are going to be um, editing tonight is version five. We have, we sent version four to the staff for their comments. Staff commented on version four, but tonight we will try to merge their comments into version five. Version five also, well, includes any of the discussion that we had last time. So uh, let's, um, let's see. I see someone else has a joint, I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack for a second. Additional people have come to the audience. If, if I'd like to reopen public comment, if there is any desire by anyone in the attendees to speak, I just finished, I just closed it. This is gonna bother Mandy Jo Haneke, but I'm gonna reopen public comments since I see people just arriving. Can somebody bring in Janet McGowan, please? Hi, um, I'm Janet McGowan again. Um, I have been looking at the, I don't know if it's volume four or version four, version five, the draft um, with the staff comments. And I just wanted to um, sort of put some perspective on things that, you know, I was on this solar bylaw working group for a year and a half and the committee consisted of a solar developer, a forester, a hydrologist, myself, an attorney and a planning board member for five years, um, the head of the clean UMass Clean Energy Extension 
and we even had a rocket scientist. So, you know, and then in the course of a year and a half, we went to lots of sources of information and you have a whole compilation of the documents that we looked at. We also had comments from CISA and NOFA. We had the survey. We had Jonathan Thompson, who works at the Harvard Forest, who has like seven pages of, um, excuse me, of writings on um, climate change in the forest, the New England forest. He also was, he helped write the state climate action plans. Um, we had people from the American Farmland Trust who also were farmers with um, um, agrovoltaics. We had a wildlife biologist from California who worked on solar arrays. We had a really good panel with people from the SMART program, um, a solar developer who's local who works on dual use we had a farm soils expert give us some comments. I mean, we just had a lot of stuff. And so as you're looking at parts of this bylaw, like I keep on saying, I know it's kind of, it's big, it has repetition, it needs kind of a good combing. And you're wondering why is it there? There's a reason it's there. <laughs> it might be said twice, but there are reasons that we put in these provisions. And we were basically implementing the CARP, the town plan and the state climate action plans and new policies. And so I would suggest that you, you know, look to the, you know, if you have questions about why things are there, you feel like, oh, this shouldn't be here, or it should delete it. You might want to look at, talk to the climate, the people from the solar bylaw working group and find out why are these provisions there. And sometimes they're there because, you know, Chris Brestrup put it there because, uh, you know, she had looked at language from different solar bylaws. So there's reasons for things. And so, I would just keep that in mind as you go ahead and, you know, look to members of the solar bylaw working group. You might want to have a session to invite us in to say, hey, there's six different provisions. You know, what's up with that? And why did you have those? Because we had lots of discussions. We had debates, but we actually came up with a document that we all voted for, as far as I remember. And that says something. And there's a lot there was a lot of depth on the on the bylaw working group, but there was a lot of depth in the people that came and talked to us, including Chris, um, the fire marshal and things like that we did. So we went through a lot and we had a lot of information. And so there's reasons for provisions. And I think just asking you to keep an, um, an attitude of inquiry and come to look for us to us if you need us. Thank you. Thank you. Um... If it's okay with everyone, I am going to move back into the action item. Pat, are you responding to something you heard or are you? Okay, okay. Go ahead, unmute, unmute. I looked at the agenda and there is no other public comment period listed in the agenda. And that was an issue that came up at our last meeting. And I feel like uh, I would like, I think there are more people in the audience and I would like them to have a chance to speak, but I don't think that we should have an unlisted public um, comment period um, af during, after we work on the solar bylaw or the uh, overlay district or whatever. And, and that's gotten to be the pattern, but I think that we need to either list it on the agenda or omit it because it's not, it's really not fair to other people who don't know that there's going to be another comment period and they think that they're too late to be here. I that's totally right. agree. I totally agree. And that's why it's on the agenda. Where it is, is it on the it agenda? For a I really number. missed it. And if it's there, I totally apologize. It, it is it is there for a number four. Oh, I I stand but it's but I you make it good, absolutely corrected but you make a good point so thank you sorry sorry wasting um, my my intent is that we're going to work on this till just about eight o'clock at which point we'll sort of pause where we are hopefully we can get through a whole section or two um and then and then in fact hold that public comment specifically on the solar bylaw um you know just just after eight and then we'll move to the rest of the agenda, which is the timing for the university drive overlay. So that's that's the goal. And um, I think the task is tonight to walk through and understand why some of the staff comments were made and agree and and so forth with them 
and incorporate them into version five. I just want to clarify, or not clarify, I just want to confirm, um, Athena, you said you were willing to do the uh, the editing as we went. Are Is your fish done? <laughs> my fish has finished cooking, but my computer has decided to run a series of updates. And so it's running updates and has restarted a couple times and it's at 24%. I don't know if this is the last update and I'm so sorry I had intended on bringing everything together and edit as we go. And I I have uh, been overruled by my technology here at home. So I apologize. Um, <laughs> it happens to the best of us. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could prevail on Mandy, if she would be willing to at least start us off. I, I'm happy to. Should I put version five up? Version five is the one. And we'll just make it as big as we possibly can, and we're all going to end up blurry-eyed tonight. So I'm, and and Chris, this is above and beyond the call of duty to uh, to show up tonight at this meeting. So thank you very much, uh, Christine and Stephanie. Uh, I am looking for staff comments. Here they are. So um, do you want to do you want to lead in with sort of the tone of of where the staff is coming from? You have a couple of intro sentences, and I think that's important for all of us to hear. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Pam. Um, so when we convene staff, we convene staff that were um, some of whom were called to appear at the solar bylaw working groups to give their sort of expert opinions and feedback on some of the, the topics at hand. So um, so Chris Bascom, for one, who is from the fire department, was part of this review, as well as was Erin Jacques, who is the wetlands administrator, Dave Zomek, the um, assistant town manager slash conservation uh, director of conservation and development. Uh, Rob Mora, the building commissioner, um, Nate Malloy, senior planner, myself, and Chris Brestrup. So we were, and I'm sorry, Amy Rusecki, who represented DPW. Um, so we we convened and we decided that rather than each come at it with individual comments, we as staff wanted to have conversation around how we felt this would work in application. So is this something that staff can work with and work with the committees and boards and committees that we represent and our liaison to, to assist with moving um, permitting through, through the town's process. So I think the first thing that we wanted to say, and this really came from Rob Mora, the building commissioner, was his specific language, is that throughout this document, you really need to adhere to rules that are measurable, enforceable, and that apply a standard. So they can't be kind of random. They can't come from somewhere else. They really need to be consistent with those things that we have in our bylaws currently, you know, that, that we have consistent language, that we have consistent format, that we have consistent standards. So um, I just wanted to say that right up front. Um, and I think um, maybe to I could start with just with the intent and purpose is that and I'll just read the, I know people in the public aren't necessarily seeing these comments, so I'm gonna read this. Um, in section 17.00, intent and purpose is to regulate. Um, this should be refined to include areas subject to protection. Specifically identify the interests you are trying to protect. Interests should be defined in a measurable way. So Erin um, Jacques, I think provided that feedback. And specifically, if we look at the wetland regulations, there are eight interests of the Wetlands Protection Act, and the regulations specifically talk about those interests. And everything can go back to um, the bylaw, but everything is very specifically identified. And um, the regulations very specifically call out um, ways to measure or define or to mitigate any impacts to those um, interests. I see Chris has her hand up, so I'm gonna pause for a second. Yes, Chris, thank you. 
Um, I noticed that what is being shown on the screen is not the version five that was in the packet, or at least the version five that I read this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So it should be you want to use the version five that was in the packet to do the editing because that has all of Stephanie's comments that came out of the staff review. Well, I need to I need to correct you just a little bit. Um, the the comments that Stephanie typed into the document were actually done on version four. And version five occurred when the CRC plowed ahead last, last meeting with comments that our members had on the document. It had already gone to staff for comments. So it's gonna be a little awkward, this first merging where we have a few changes that are made already with staff comments trying to be incorporated. So it should, so version five should have been in our packet. Um, I'm, it was in my packet. Um, Pat, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, so this, the new intent, uh, the new purpose was looked at by staff and Rob Moore, and we heard what Rob Moore said, and I believe you said, I'm, I'm sorry, Stephanie, I'm blanking on who you said change this. And I think it's good, it's not about that. What I'm trying to understand is, are the comments that are here, are they the comments from the version four or are they com new comments as well that are under your name that are from other staff members as well? I'm just trying to get a clarification. And I may be misunderstanding something. These, the, the, I'm the a little drunk tonight because I'm in pain. So I'm okay, little, well, we'll try to make goofy. it as comfortable as possible for you. The first paragraph, in fact, was wording that Mandy Jo Haneke brought to the meeting last time. Okay. And she and she brought in her request to show that there was a balance between regulating and protection. Mm -hmm. And the notes on the right-hand side, I believe, are all from the Version the previous four. version, uh, because any of the corrections that were made during the September, I think it was 24 meeting of the CRC were captured by Mandy and they show her as the author. So this is an old version. Uh, yeah, why aren't we looking at the at the version with Mandy Jo Haneke's wording? So we are looking at the version with yeah, it. Yeah. Um, what's I'm not confused. showing on this is the the Stephanie comments on this one are from version yeah. three and four that were left over and went to staff. The other document that was in the packet is the staff comments, which were so different comments than this on, on a draft that would include anything crossed out here. Um, so any redlined items is what the staff was commenting on and the comments that Stephanie just read. I can put both up at the same time, but you all are going to say you can't read them. <laughs> because they're going to be small. There's no way for me to, I could split screen to put them both up, but then it's going to be very hard to read. Um, and the version five that we modified last meeting was the one that the chair asked that I put up. I could put up the version four, but then we're still going to have to cross-reference some of the discussion yeah. we had two weeks ago and the changes we made to that version. Go go ahead, Stephanie, and I then just Jennifer. Wanted, I just wanted to be really clear. So yes, I just want to say it simply. The version that you were sent with staff comments mm -hmm. is from version four, not from your last meeting. Correct. From your previous meeting. So the changes that you made at the last meeting, staff did not see. Correct. They did not review. I just wanted to make that perfectly clear to everybody that we did not see the comments that you made at the last meeting. Yep. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, Gen Jennifer and then and then Mandy. So my question is just in the packet, there's version five. I think it's the same version. It's, it looks like to be the same, yep. you know, and it, but it's dated September 25th and there's one October 4th, but they're the same document. 
if it's dated the 24th. It no, one's the, uh, September 25th and one is October 4th. They both say version five. And mm -hmm. they're, it looks like they're the same size. So I wonder if that's what's confusing at all. Well, let's double check. I what mean, they it? both what say 4A, but yeah. I guess they were uploaded on different dates. I don't know. Uh, let's, let's go. I'm looking now. Oh, Mandy and... might have the answer. Do you, Councilor yeah, Hannah? Mandy, you got your hand up. You're muted, they, Mandy. They might have been up, they uploaded on different days. I was going to make a potential suggestion. You'd have to bear with me. I could share the staff comment version. And while we look at that, put in the changes we made last week into that version so that we can see the staff comments while also seeing the changes that we made last week. But I'd be doing that on the fly so they'd just be showing up as I can get them in. But if people would like that because they want to see the staff comments, I can do that. You just have to be patient with me. Stephanie. I, I just wanted to say that the version that I sent you with staff comments yep. do not have any red line at all. The staff did not make any changes to language or wording. Yep. That's right. All we did was keep all of our suggestions to the comment bar. So I'm not sure if you use that version, if it might get really confusing. I just wonder if perhaps how we could do this, I'm trying to think of a way to help you streamline, is maybe continue going through, uh, the confusion right now is just going over the stuff that you already worked on at the last meeting, which staff yes. didn't see. So you have comments that are actually referring to the previous draft. So mm -hmm. I wonder, there are two things you could do. You could either skip ahead to where you left off and pick up staff comments from there. And then we could maybe have staff review the changes you made because we still have to review some other sections. It's not complete. That's one suggestion. My other suggestion would be for me to just read the, the staff comment at the beginning of each section so that I can read you the comment, but you can still display what you have on the screen. I don't know if that would be helpful. Thank you. I was gonna offer to do exactly that. Because I, I took all your comments and put them on one sheet. So I consolidated all staff comments onto one page or several pages. Um, I think that would be good. I'd like to use version five to make our ongoing changes because we already have correct, corrected some things. Um, but I think incorporating, and Mandy, this is a drag on you just to have to, to type that in. But we can go back and double check and do it later as well to bring stuff over. The second, the comment that Stephanie made, so what we're really talking about is the is sort of the entree, the applicability, the nexus statement. Um, there were several comments about maybe the nexus statements could get incorporated into section 1701. That felt like a big chunk to take on tonight. I was actually going to suggest that we move ahead and let that stand. So this might be a good opportunity to move ahead like Stephanie suggested and go to section 1703. Staff has looked at this, we have looked through it, but the changes aren't tremendous. And then move from there into section 17.04, which is substantial. Does everybody feel okay with that? Just nod your head or something. Okay, okay. And I'm not seeing everybody's face. So we're we're gonna put on hold section 1700, 1701, and 1702, if that's okay with everyone. And we will continue with this version five. I looked in my file in our in our SharePoint folder and we clearly have in our SharePoint folder, at least, we have the staff comments that they made on the September 4 document, or they labeled it September 4. We also have our zoning bylaw version five, which we modified on September 24. And those numbers are close enough that they're very confusing. 
So we're now working on version five, originally dated 2024-09-24. Here we are at the beginning of our conversation and it's taken us only 15 minutes to get here. So let's do it. So who wants to start out? We have, we have uh, a few notes from staff. Stephanie, do you want to do you want to introduce that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so it says to keep the definitions here and ensure there is no conflict with definitions elsewhere in the general bylaw. For example, how a battery is defined. Ensure consistency throughout the document. For example, references to both large storm event and, ha and heavy rain event should be either one or the other. It should be defined and it should be one or the other, but um, frequently it sometimes will say a heavy rain event or it will say a large storm event. So yeah. uh, those are the only comments uh, at the beginning of that section. Cool. Um, and then I don't know if you want me to go to others or just wait. Um, let's talk about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's talk about batteries because we have at least one, two, three, three elements, three items that are related to batteries. Um, and you have a staff definition if you want, if you want to read it or I can read it. Um, you're, um, I, you are the chair. <laughs> you tell me what you'd like to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to keep some of the work off your shoulder. Uh, okay. I'll read it this time. We can take turns. Okay. Um, batteries. The staff has said, um, delete this. The reference should actually be to the ba a best battery energy storage system. So the suggestion was to delete a single cell or group of cells connected electron electrically in series, which can charge and, and discharge and store energy. For the purposes of, the, of this bylaw, batteries utilized in consumer products are excluded from these requirements. Delete, references should be to best. So I understand that the that the interest is to just to simply take out the 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 definition of batteries originally or in its entirety. Is that correct? Uh, yes, for batteries, because I believe it's elsewhere in other regulations as well. And it was thought to be confusing and um, not a fully accurate definition. Um, and and you, I will say we weren't going to attribute comments to anyone specifically, yeah. but I will say that that this was Chris Bascom. Okay. We remove this. And do you know where else they're referenced? Was he clear on where else they were referenced? Uh, there are fire regulations uh, that exist that have to be uh, referred to. Um, that's what they basically uh, sort of... Um, governed by and you know that's the the rules that they follow so um we were say he was saying that it really didn't necessarily make sense to define batteries in this way so i i think he just felt that battery energy storage system was sufficient for uh for this purpose of the solar storage and we show this one as struck Right. Was there any comment on the battery energy storage management system? To me, that seemed extreme, uh, you know, superfluous. It doesn't feel that way to me. May I speak? Sure. Yeah. It doesn't feel superfluous to me because it, you know, you're talking about something that is going to help um, deal with the battery energy storage system. So management system is protecting that system from operating outside its parameters. Um, so I'm not sure, it doesn't feel redundant to me, but I'm open to hearing more. Um, could, could I make a suggestion if we have, if we have a good battery, a best definition and we could change it to the one that the staff suggested and perhaps at the end of that, it would say, and could include the management of 
I'm sorry. I got, can you say that again? I apologize. Yeah, I'm and I, I'm looking at my notes here just to see if I can find it. And it may contain a management system that takes some of the words from the previous sentence. So battery energy storage system definition, it ends up to provide electricity or other grid services when needed, comma, it, it, may, it, it may also contain a management system doesn't it's it's i'm not not wedded to that i guess i'm 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 not sure why it needs yep. to be I'm still that. not feeling like taking it out i'm fine or um, leaving it leaving it in it doesn't feel like it i under i really do appreciate the idea of consistency et cetera, et cetera. i think that's something important and measurable and enforceable blah 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 but here is a, you know, um, is is this a system that is built in? And Stephanie, I look to you. Or um, is this a management system? Is it built into, or is it an addition to a BES? Um, I, I will say that staff did not have a problem with battery energy storage management management system because they are two separate things, and that good. was they did not strike it. They did not suggest that it good. be in. Okay, good. Great. So let's leave it. I think Mandy, okay. uh, Councillor Haneke has her hand up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mandy. Two things. Sorry. I still don't know. I'm not sure I can actually hit a raise hand button while I'm sharing a screen. Yeah, it's hard. Um, <laughs> I can look. I'll, I'll look again and see if I can find it. Um, two things. The only time battery, battery energy storage management system is actually used in this bylaw is this definition. It's never mentioned again. So in that sense, it probably doesn't need to find unless we intend to use it at some point somewhere else in the bylaw, but it is not actually used anywhere in the bylaw right now. And general drafting, regulatory drafting practice is you don't define something that is never used because <laughs> that just confuses things. If we are going to keep it in because there's a place to put it somewhere else in the bylaw, um, I have a question as to the definition right now says an electronic system that protects energy storage systems. Is it supposed to be exclusive to battery energy storage systems or just any energy storage system um, that might not be clear enough. And if it's supposed to be exclusive to best systems, then we should actually say best yeah. in the two, I believe it's the two places that energy storage system is mentioned in this definition. But I think at this point it could be deleted because it's not used anywhere else. Any issues with that? Can Staff. we just redline redline it and and if we need to come back, we'll we'll come haul it back. I'd like to go to the staff a suggestion on the wording for battery storage system itself. And that says change the definition to an off-grid or standalone battery storage system that is not connected to the electricity grid. Did you, did you catch that, Mandy? Did you want me to put that in here? Yeah, that's a, this, is purposes? A, this is a suggested, uh, Chris, has your you have your hand up. Yeah, I don't think that's correct. I think that off-grid system is uh, referred to down below. Um, after mitigation, there's a definition of off-grid yep. system. And um, I think that we do need this um, battery energy storage system described pretty much the way it's described here. It can okay. be um, it can be off grid, I suppose, but most likely it is connected to the grid and it's probably, it may also be connected to a 
solar array, but it could be a standalone installation. But I don't consider that it would be off-grid necessarily, no. So in correcting this, there there is actually no change to this definition except um, Mandy added the word best, which is appropriate, but we're going to take out the cross outs and we're going to take out an off grid or standalone battery storage system. Um, can I say why I crossed out the the first part and started with sure. an electrical chem? Yeah. Because every other definition starts with that. It doesn't, none of the other definitions say heavy rain event. Heavy rain event is a rain yeah. event that produces. So this was for consistency purposes is yep. why those changes were made. Thank you. We have a definition of forest and it should be prime forest. So, um, Stephanie or Chris, this is the actual definition itself should only refer to prime forests? Yes, because they stated that it's prime forests that you are protecting. Can I, can I say that an area of at least an acre and a quarter um, with 16 foot halt, tall high trees does not sound like a prime forest to me, but I could be wrong. Well, that's, I, so we have, um, well, so there is a definition of prime forest land and you reference that in other um, state definitions. So I think their point was you should have a definition for prime forests and that's what you should use to protect. It was a little wonky while we were trying to do this ourselves. Um, so that was really the intention. And I think um, for just forests, Erin Jacques is going to, was going to draft a definition. Um, she mm -hmm. was not at the last meeting, unfortunately, um, but I, the last we left, she was going to draft some language for forests, for just forests. Super. Pat. You're muted. Yeah, I, I don't know whether this is the time to do it now because we're going through staff things, but uh, I want to make sure that ECHO uh, system service uh, definition is back in this. Um, I've edited it down so it's shorter than the definition that was here. Uh, and we do have a section 1707 that's about the maximization of ecosystem services. So it feels like that definition should be here, but I can wait till the next time if we just want to go through what staff is talking about right now. Can we can we put a placeholder then for this yes, and please. just have the have the title? That would be great. Thank you. Jennifer. I'm just wondering is prime forest what is that what is that definition? Does it have to do with the maturity of the trees or? Um, there's a state definition. So sorry, I'm going to have to find where. Oh, I can look it up. So that's why it's a state definition. Yeah, yeah it's Department that. of Agriculture. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have prime forest, so that'll get relocated alphabetically. Um, Chris has her hand up. Oh, Chris, sorry, thank you. I just wanted to note that I think Aaron Jacques was getting to the point of saying prime forest is what we want to protect. Forests in general may not be what we want to protect. And I think that's why she was trying to make us define prime forest, but forest in general wasn't necessarily something she wanted to define. That was my understanding. So so I thought the original intent was was working working land, so working forests. And that definition that we see right here is a lot more akin to a working forest. It's a woodlot or it's, you know, whatever. Um it does feel a little awkward to just to have to define the prime forest. Um, 
I, I think we're saying that you can have, sorry to jump in. Yeah, <laughs> um, please do, please I, do. I think what we were trying to say, and what, to, to Chris's point, we're trying to say what you really want to protect are prime forests, and that's a, a cult, agriculturally defined forest. What we were saying is forests in general need a definition, but this one is not it. We did not think that this was an appropriate definition for forests. Um, and so that's why Aaron was going to come up with something to draft for you. So again, that was the distinction. Um, and to the point of people also brought up, you know, you need, if you're going to use this kind of a definition, it needs to be measurable. And if you were going to talk about tree canopy coverage, the question was, well, would someone have to go out and measure every single tree and every single height and every single DBH? So, no. um, so we just, that's why we were asking for a separate definition for forests and then specifically to protect prime forests and use the, the definition that the state uses. Okay. Can we just make a note at the end of that uh, definition then that, that we may get a new definition? And I would just say um, canopy cover, if you talk to a forester, you would, for one thing, you could almost use an air photo analysis and you could identify what your percent cover is on an existing parcel. And that's something that's typically done just to talk about density of, of woods. Jennifer. Uh, before Jennifer, Mandy had her hand up. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I can't. I, that's I okay. I'll do that as long as you don't mind my doing it. No, nope, I don't mind you doing it. Um, my comments on ecosystem services. So if, if Jennifer's is on forest conversation, she can go first. So this is, um, I don't, for my own edification, it, the Department of Agriculture defines prime timberland as that that can produce at least 85 cubic feet of wood per acre per year. Now, is that something someone would have to go out and measure, or is that something pe someone in that field would know? You hire a forester. You hire a forester to work. Yeah, and they just, so is that a complicated, is that a, not a complicated thing to do? No, you just have to pay somebody to do no. it. Okay. Yes. Chris has her hand raised. I, I, I called on her, yeah. So I wanted to make the point that I think um, timberland would not necessarily be something we wanted to protect as opposed to prime forest, which right. we would want to protect. Okay, so timberland I just Googled it and that's what it came up with. So there's a different definition. Okay, for prime forest land. I'm just saying timberland is something that is a working forest. The reason you're growing the trees is to harvest them, whereas a prime forest is probably something that has some merit in terms of its plants and animals and different things that live there that you would want to protect. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. Thank you. I don't want to take up time so, on this. So, Mandy, can we just put a little note, just see new definition? Because it's hard to see it when it's over on the side. I know there's it's already there. I I don't understand what you want yeah. me to do. Um, at, after the word after the coverage of forty percent, just put a little parens and say new definition needed. Thank you. To, okay, Mandy, to your point, um, Pat had her hand up. Um, no, I was just going to say we had said just make a note about ecosystem services. Yes. And is that agreeable to you so that we would come back to it next yes. time, Mandy? Well, yes. So we can keep moving with staff stuff or not? Well, That's my question about that was that doesn't take into account the staff comment that we have about ecosystem services, which is staff unanimously agree that a definition of references within the bylaw to ecosystem services are far too broad, duplicative of existing regulatory processes would be considered overreach by the PGA and are not enforceable. Um, so I think, I, I guess we could put a note in to say we need to talk about that next time, but yeah, I, because I, I edited, want that not to be mentioned. Right, I, I did edit it down in some ways so we can come back to it next time. Let's put it in for now. We'll come back to it. We can all do some homework and think about how to tighten it up. 
there are some there are some important concepts in there that um, you know whether it's a housing development or anything else when you pull a, a section of habitat or or forested area out and replace it with something else you're disrupting certain systems and the point is are you recreating some of the pathways are you recreating some of the uh, the systems that exist there stephanie sorry um yes i i just i wanted to say that that is what we see is that we think that there are pathways existing already in our regulatory processes and we don't see this same definition or protection for large housing developments or elsewhere in the bylaw. It doesn't exist. So it's like we're creating something entirely new that's duplicative of other processes. And I think, you know, there may be things in there that you want to flush out, but I think to create this term and have a whole new set of guidance to follow is um, we think it's going to be overreach and that it will set us up for legal action is kind of unanimously how we felt. The whole section on maximization of ecosystem services is what you're talking about now? Yeah, yes, we felt, yes, we felt ecosystem services as a, as a category, as a new definition and as a category because it's nowhere else in the bylaw and no other um, development has to undergo the same kind of rigor. And so it seems really broad and a lot um, okay. and so we, we think can. it's covered. We think, you know, like we think there are protections for habitat and for wildlife and those those show up elsewhere in other existing regulations. So we didn't feel like we needed this as well. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, I know this would be an extra thing. Can you at some point email me where some of those protections are mm -hmm. so that I could look at it for next time? I'd appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're going to do that, just send it to all of us, if if you could, please. Thank you. Um, Glare. The staff said it's not measurable. Delete this definition. Stephanie, you want to talk about that? I, I don't think I have more to say than, than <laughs> what they said was, you know, the folks who work with the permitting processes felt that you really couldn't measure this as defined. And that's why I was saying before, it's like definable, like what is glare? You know, there it's a, it's a pretty general, it's a generally understood definition of what glare is and there wasn't anything specific that could be measured. So that's why I think they said to delete it. Uh, Jennifer's got her hand up, but I also am going to look at, at Councillor Haneke to talk about glare. Uh, uh, let, um, I'll let Councillor Haneke go first. <laughs> I wasn't planning on saying anything. I agree with deleting it from this bylaw. But if you've got questions, I mean, glare, you can't really measure glare. You can say whether there is glare or right. not but it's hard to measure it. And there are so ways to minimize it, but you still can't measure it, really. It's there or it's not. So I just have a question. This, I, you know, I said this before, this is really out of my comfort zone. I just know that I'm even thinking of some emails the councils receive from people about, you know, solar, that glare has come up as a concern. So how how is that addressed? How would the ZBA address that? I'm going to respond to that unless Stephanie, you still have your hand up, but um, they're going to address it probably through screening. And my, my take on the glare is that we're actually talking about reflection of uncomfortably bright light. It's the, it's the reflection of the sun that's that's what's being screened. It's not just the the visibility of seeing panels. It's the it's the the opportunity for reflected light um, that needs to be blocked. And so it's it's kind of presence or absence of glare shining in your window 
that is is being protected against. So this, okay. So so the, a, a permitting granting authority would know this is something they have to mitigate or minimize if there's a butters without it being spelled out here. That's my okay. question. Mandy has her hand up also. Okay, Stephanie and then Mandy. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that I think this is one of those situations where if the ZBA were looking at this, or if for any reason anything ever came to the planning board, it's one of those things that would be conditioned um, to minimize glare. So you wouldn't necessarily measure it, but you would provide guidance to minimize glare of the project from impacting adjacent properties. So I think that's, to me, that's kind of a standard condition. Uh, Mandy, and then I just wanted to comment on that. So Pam, Pam said something that got me thinking. Glare, uh, you, you talked about the reflection of light, and that's the concern. That's not really glare. Glare is when you're looking directly at the light, not the reflection of a light off of a different surface, per se. Um, you know, and so it's it's not necessarily the glare that you're trying to protect from. It's the reflection of sunlight off of a surface right. that is directionalized to a specific area. And that's not really a definition of a term. Um, but it it I think instead of minimizing glare or whatever, you talk about it in your in your um you can potentially write language within the standards and conditions of if we're going to do screening, what the screening's purpose is, um, and that the screening should be for, you know, minimizing reflected light into specific areas or stuff like that, not, you know, that, that would get into the purpose of the screening Mm -hmm. And what you're looking at minimizing, not necessarily defining a term at this point. So in that case, I looking at Chris, if if you don't have the word glare in here and you don't generally describe it, is the ZBA going to think to minimize it? Unless I um, unless I you're me, right? You I said you are, you're asking me. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that ZBA would be aware of glare as an issue, and it would probably be brought up by a butters and <laughs> yes. would get the conversation, and the ZBA would determine what would be an appropriate mitigation. So it doesn't necessarily need to be defined here. Okay. Is everyone is everyone yes or no or shake your head okay with taking out the word glare? Thumbs up. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be mentioned anywhere in the bylaw that this is something that needs to be considered. Well, Mandy did mention that maybe in in the screening section that the purpose okay. from the purpose okay. for screening we right. should she make did say sure that, that we... I would want to see it. There. I think that I'd feel better if it was there. Yeah, I don't think we need a definition, but we can put make sure some sort of minimum. You know, talk about whether we want into screening the reasons for screening. I right. think that goes back to some of the comments Stephanie and the staff made up at the beginning, the bullet points on what are you protecting? <laughs> yeah. You know, right. Okay. That, that makes reason sense. There for why the screening regulation is there is because you need to minimize that reflection of sunlight into particular or it, towards particular surfaces whether that's a home's window, I, we can talk about where, what you would look to be minimizing it, but I don't think it goes in definitions, which is where we are. Thank you. Good. Okay, we're striking it. And are we agreed that it's a heavy rain event rather than a large rain event? <laughs> Mandy. So heavy rain event is fine with me. I have a problem with this definition. Um, not, 
it's measurable. It's all of that. My problem is I'd like to add language that says measured at blank by blank. Because a rain event that produces a half inch or more of rainfall in a 24 per hour period, where? On the parcel? Anywhere in Amherst? Anywhere in the state of Massachusetts? Anywhere in Hampshire County? Where does this heavy rain event need to occur? And I think that needs to be part of the definition. Where is this event occurring? And if it's occurring on the parcel, you need to indicate whose job is it. At, at some point somewhere in here, you then need to indicate whose job is it to measure that and determine that that event actually happened. Um, as you know, as I know, various parts of our town that is very long can have varying, quite varying degrees of precipitation from the same storm. Um, I think about snowstorms where sometimes I have maybe a half an inch and North Amherst five miles away has gotten five or six inches of snow. Um, if you know, So I think we need further defining what a heavy rain event is in relationship to the permit. Well, in this case, we don't know where we don't know where the the site would be. Chris, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you answer that. Um, I was talking to Dave Zomick about this at some point. I can't remember if Stephanie was there or not, and and he did say that um, rain is measured in certain areas of this region, and there are recognized places where it's measured, and that's where when the meteorologist on television says we had a rainfall of. X number of inches in so and so amount of time. Those are recognized places where this is measured. So it's not measured everywhere, but it is measured in certain locations. I understand Mandy's point, but um, it's also recognized by um, people like Aaron Jacques, who are concerned about heavy rain events with regard to erosion. And so I think having her input on this topic would be helpful. I'm not an expert, but I, I know that it is measured in certain locations and it is very important for um, erosion control. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Stephanie. Um, Erin did actually provide this definition, I believe, and it was referenced from existing regulations. I'm not sure if they were the state stormwater regulations, but um, I can find out where she got it, but I know that it did come from her. Amen, hey, Mandy. So that's a very good reason to keep it in. I, I'm not saying to delete it. I think it needs more specificity. Um, Greenfield, Springfield. No, North come Memphis? on. If, where... You know, I, I, I guess the, they're given given climate change. I, I, I've heard you, Christine, about there are specific areas where it's measured, but if you don't define which one you're taking within this bylaw you've got non-clear regulations and arguments over which one counts <laughs> because Greenfield measures and Springfield measures. What if Springfield received a quarter inch in 24, but Greenfield received two inches in 24 hours? Who, you're gonna be arguing over whether it was actually a heavy rain event because you're taking it from different spots. And so I think we need to define either the meteorological station you're taking it from or the town you're taking it from or or something more than just the heavy rain event occurred in Massachusetts. Because right now you could argue that a Boston heavy rain event meets this definition somehow. And I don't think it's specific enough and leaves open the possibility of people fighting and disagreeing and arguing over whether a heavy rain event actually occurred. I'm going to I'm going to make a call and that is that we're going to ask Erin Jacques what she uses when she you know when she goes decides to go check Hickory Ridge and what what is the trigger what source does she use and we'll just reference that source. And it's going to be somewhat generally local. It's either Westover or Greenfield. Um, is that sufficient? I mean, it would be what she calls for her purposes. It's it's 
her need to know that there's been a major event and she needs to go check on to see if the erosion, you know, ribbons or whatever stayed up. Is that okay, Mandy? As long as okay. we come back to it and, and get that answer, yeah. Okay. Um, large scale ground mounted, here's our, here's our thing. Large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installation. Uh, no change with that. Sorry, I didn't mean to stop on something with no comments. Yellow, the yellow highlighted. Uh, we, it was requested that we remove the links because in fact they may change. We need to just reference the Department of Agriculture and their soil maps. Is that correct, Stephanie and Chris? Um, yes. What are we on right now? We are on prime farmland. Oh, there were comments on mitigation and off-grid systems. Yeah. Oh, we skipped over them. Sorry, you're right. Let's go back to mitigation. Do we ever in this plan actually mitigate? Um, I, I think to the this was a staff comment that this is a very common mitigation and that if you say you are going to mitigate, you don't you don't need to have this definition. And it's elsewhere in the bylaw yeah. as well, in the general bylaws. Mm, yeah. Anybody feel badly about taking this out? Can you read I'm not sure I want it out. I well, so so further in the document, Pat, staff had recommended that we not use, I think there was a mitigation plan, but we don't really know what we're mitigating for. And it was uh, suggested that we call it an impact plan or impact assessment where you could describe the impacts to certain elements um, and that we aren't really mitigate. We we haven't said we're going to mitigate, you know, one acre of forest, four acres of forest for every one acre of forest that's cut. We aren't, and nowhere in this document do we suggest that kind of true mitigation. Um, but we, but we are looking for factors. We are looking for installation methods that will reduce impacts to you know, everything. Does that feel okay if we address it in that manner? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. We can move on, but I'll, I'll, I want to look at a couple of things and then we'll, I'll come back to it next time. Uh, Chris, you put your hand down. Did. Oh, I just wanted to say, to reiterate what Stephanie said, it's a common term Okay. That and so it doesn't really need to be defined. That was the point that was made in the staff meeting. Yeah, no, I get that. Okay. So off-grid okay. system, off-grid system, that seems to be okay. I didn't see any suggestions for change. Prime farmland. There was a suggestion. Oh, there was? There's a Where? comment that says change oh. definition to a standalone renewable energy system yep. that is not connected to the grid. Thank you. Where Thank are you. we? I'm looking at three different pieces of paper. Uh, Off-grid system. And the recommendation was that it the definition changed to a standalone renewable energy system that is not connected to the grid. Should it be electric grid? Or is grid a common enough term to know? I think you could say electric grid just to be specific. Electrical. Yeah, we have electrical grid somewhere else too that we talked about. Yeah. I think we just missed that. Yep. Thank you for catching that. Yep. So now we're on prime farmland. Again, as defined by Department of Agriculture. Uh, and we would remove the link, which might not be forever. And also note that the staff was clear that we should be using the words prime farmland throughout. Stephanie, sorry, your hand's up. 
sorry, yeah, I just wanted to note that um, I think I said this elsewhere, um, the comment is elsewhere, but any hyperlinks that are referenced, staff felt they should be removed because um, very often regulations will change and where you find them, you won't find them at a future point. And then you would have to actually amend the bylaw itself. I just wanna be clear about why we recommended this for everybody that you would have to go back and amend the entire bylaw versus if it's, if you have accompanying regulations, you could put it in there if you wanted. And then if that gets changed, that's easy to change. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I think Mandy's hand, uh, Councillor Haneke's oh, hands up. Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't necessarily, I, it reads weird, prime farmland as defined by the US department, what, as you know, I, I know I, I said earlier, we don't start a definition with prime farmland is blah or off grid system is after we name it. But I feel like this one's missing something in this language that like that needs, we might have to re-say prime farmland, you know, or Amherst land defined as prime farm, like I, I all, I, I don't know. I feel like we're missing something within this definition. Can I offer up land, land best suited for agricultural production as defined by the US Department of Agriculture? That may have come from Pat. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to balance three things here. I'm, <laughs> I lost track of the conversation, I apologize. I, I think um, the prime farmland definition, land that, I think the, the original definition was land that has the best combination of physical and chemical characteristics for agricultural production as defined by, and I've shortened it to land best suited for agricultural production as defined by NRCS. That's fine with me. I have a question. Does yes. prime farmland have to be farmed at this point and in agricultural actually in agricultural production to be defined as prime farmland or could a a forest that happens to be in a floodplain and therefore gets regularly flooded and so has soils that are very well suited for agriculture but is clearly not in agriculture at any time at, at the time because it's forested and natural growth, would that constitute prime farmland too? Like, do we have to, I, I just don't know what this map, how, how it shows it. Christine. Um, it shows it whether it's forested or not. If it's prime farmland, it could be farmland that was once farmed and forest grew up and the the land is still prime farmland. But what it wouldn't show is land that is underwater or land that is, you know, continuously waterlogged or has a, a real problem with high water table because that would not be suitable for agricultural production. Thank you. So the definition doesn't require it to be in farming condition per. No. Okay, thanks. Uh, rated name plate capacity doesn't look like there was any change to that. Um, small scale ground mounted photovoltaic installation, no change to that. Um, soils and farmlands of statewide importance. Was there a change to that? So I had a question on small scale ground mount. Yep. If these definitions are staying within this section and only applying to this section, I'm not sure this definition is needed at all um, because this, this bylaw section article 
and definitions only by by what says here only apply to large scale ground mount solar, which is defined. And therefore, if it doesn't meet that definition, it doesn't matter what anything else is defined as versus if we're moving the definitions out of this article into Article 12, then maybe we need to keep it. Small scale ground mount solar a photovoltaic is not used anywhere else except in the definitions in the current article. And the only place I see it would actually be necessary to have is if it's in Article 12 to reference a new land use um, category within the land use table in Article 3. But right now, Article 17 as written, those, those definitions do not yeah. apply anywhere other than Article 17, so they don't even apply to the use table in Article 3. Yeah, Chris, I agree with what Mandy just said, Miss Councillor Haneke. Anybody else feel strongly about keeping it if we don't reference it? Um, I don't see the reason to keep it if we don't reference it, but I'm not uh, sure I want the, I believe that the definitions need to be in this bylaw as well, and not just simply move to section you know, uh, 12 in the zoning bylaws. So, but we can talk about that later. Well, if, if mm, Chris, do you want to address that? Well, I think Councillor Haneke is correct that if we are going to regulate small scale ground mounted photovoltaic, whatever, um, <laughs> it should be in the um, definitions section since it's not regulated by this particular section. And we should talk about it in Article 3 and put it in the, the category of use table, um, which we do intend to put large scale ground mounted and mm -hmm. BES. In, the, in that table, but I do agree that it doesn't really relate to this section. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. I just wanted to reiterate that staff recommended that definitions stay in this section. Hmm. Was there a reason for that? I think just because some of the terms were very, very specific um, to solar, uh, I don't I was kind of, honestly, I was kind of surprised we went a little bit back and forth, mm -hmm. but that was in the end, the general unanimous opinion. So I don't remember all of the reasoning, but I think we felt that it was better to keep this here. So I'm just, that might, whether you decide to do that or not, that might dictate whether you keep that definition in or out. I'm I'm hearing a I'm hearing a toss up. We could do rock paper scissors. Nah, <laughs> let's keep it. <laughs> let's keep it for now. Let's put a big question mark by it. A I had a question I mark. <laughs> I had a I had a, a note to me as well as where do we refer to this other otherwise, and we don't. May I Mandy has her hand up. Sorry. Yep, Mandy. I'll I'll put a note under small scale, large scale, and BESS systems. Um. If you're going to create use table lines for them, those definitions must absolutely be in Article 12. Right. Um, and so those three, small scale ground mount photovoltaic, large scale ground mount photovoltaic and BESS probably all need to be moved to Article 12 so that they apply to Article 3's use table. Um, and then maybe within this one, if we're keeping definitions here, those three could just say as defined in Article 12. You could leave the line here and say as defined in Article 12 um, for the other two, and then you wouldn't need small scale here. But maybe all three of those definitions need to be in Article 12. With can the you just can you just two. put that note then behind those behind that? Possible possible Article Twelve reference.
Are we moving it or are we repeating it? Okay, fair enough. Great. Okay, now we're down to we're down to um, soils and farmland of statewide importance. Again, we remove the link, and this should also refer to prime farmlands. Well, if you, if it's if it's soil of statewide importance, it's definitely prime farmland. And I think it's just called soils and farmlands of statewide importance, right? Yes. Excuse me. The two are not equivalent to prime farmland. Soils and farmlands of statewide importance is a separate category. And it does say nearly prime farmland, which supports what Chris is saying. And we are protecting soils and farmlands of statewide importance. Okay, everybody know what solar energy is? Solar energy system, no comments there. Um, solar energy system, I actually I actually had a, a deletion in part of it. It says uh, a device or structural design feature. I didn't think we needed to say a substantial purpose of which is to provide daylight for interior lighting. I just thought it should could it could be a device or structural design feature to provide for the collection of and storage and so forth. But that second sentence, second phrase didn't seem to do anything for me. It's like we don't care what it's for. <laughs> well, I, hmm. I don't know. So I had a, a similar question. I, a device or structural design feature a, 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 to provide for the collection, storage and distribution of so I, I guess I was confused by this definition. Is it, is it a solar array or is it just windows or that happen to heat the I, I I was confused by what this was and particularly the provide daylight for interior lighting yeah I mean that means any window is a solar energy system so I was really confused what was going on with this yeah Pat, I was Pat go ahead yeah I I I was thinking you know sometimes you see these very small um solar panels on street signs and things like that. And sometimes people, like I had friends who have a cabin and they have a small solar panel on wheels that they take out during the daytime and then use to uh, power things in their cabin. So I that, I just assume it meant things like that. So what what is the, what did staff have a reaction to this or is there something? Are we missing something, Stephanie? Um, Staff did not have a reaction to this, otherwise we would have commented. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think anyone felt strongly one way or the other. Does it add to our knowledge base? There are so many things in life that don't. <laughs> Let's not worry about it. <laughs> Does anybody feel badly about taking that out? I, I, I didn't know what it really meant either. 
I mean, because we're getting close to a battery energy storage system or, you know. Um, so what part would, would did you suggest taking out, Pam? I, I was suggesting taking out after the first comma. To where? Uh, to the word provide and then just add to provide for the collection, storage, and distribution of solar energy. I mean, to me, that's very close to a BES or... Anyway, Stephanie, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think this is also trying to get to passive solar, which is mm. basically a window. And that is why it says a, a device or a structural design feature, which would be a window, you know, that allows sunlight in. So I think that's why it references um, providing daylight. So I, I'm not, but I don't know why you would need that here, honestly. I, I don't, I don't know that you really need this definition. I, I would, agree. I would agree. It's, we're not trying to. But regulate. thank you, but thank you for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Can we, can we delete that? Please? So it's used up above in solar energy um, and a couple of other definitions. Uh, well, it, it's there's five times in here it's used in solar energy within the definition itself under solar photovoltaic installation it's used. Mm -hmm. And then in 1715, it's got two uses if uh, under abandonment. If the owner or operator of the solar energy system fails to remove the installation, I think those could easily be changed to LGPI um, because yeah. otherwise you're talking about LGPIs. If you if you go down to 1715, there's two other uses of solar energy system that can probably be changed. Um, and then we could get rid of this definition. I like that idea. Uh, under solar pho photovoltaic array, could we add the word arrangement of multiple solar photovoltaic panels? I mean, I guess the plural of panels indicates there's more than well, one. Well, it's a panel, so the panels already take care of. That's what I said. It's it's a plural. Yeah, so it doesn't need. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> Did staff have any other changes? No, not in that section. It is it is about six minutes before eight. We have we have hit 1704 submittal requirements. That's another whole bag of uh bag of worms. Um I I suggest that we pause here. We've got really good incorporation of the of the staff comments. And so next time we will come back to the 1700, 1701, 1702. And let's see. And we will, um, I'm just thinking I could, I could bring in what we have into what Mandy packages up tonight. So this will be version six. Mandy, you got your hand up, sorry. Oh, I, I was just going to say, um, given a little bit of time, I can easily merge this document with the staff comment document that will show all of our track changes for what we've done and all of the staff comments within the same document to make it easier in the future. Um, it, it'll just take me a little bit to double check that the word um, re legal redlining worked properly um, when I when I do merge the two documents, but yeah. it should be possible to do that fairly easily into one document. So that, that would be great. Really and that will be our version six. That will be the basis for next discussion. Counselor Thank Ate. You. Pardon? Pat? Counselor Ate has yes, his hand up. I, I see that. I'm, I'm coming. Counselor Ate. 
Um, if we could go back to the end of the definitions, I was just wondering where we have a solar energy system that converts solar energy directly into electricity through an arrangement of solar photovoltaic panels. That is speaking of an array. So is there a reason why we would have the definition of an array instead of just mentioning that it is an array? I'm sorry, can you can you repeat the concern? So the last two definitions, the penultimate is solar photovoltaic array, yeah. which is an arrangement of solar photovoltaic panels. But that is also what we have as the end of the final definition. And I was wondering if we could mm. just as well use array there. Do you want to do you want to suggest some wording? I think he's I've already suggested the wording array. I think he's saying are yeah, you no. saying delete that and just leave voltaic no. installation? No, I'm not saying delete it. Since we already have the definition of the array as okay. an arrangement of panels, and yeah. that is what the definition is, we could just put is that in? Got it. Got it. Um, one other thing. Can we delete solar energy here? Because right now it's a solar energy system that converts solar energy versus I think it should could just read a system that converts solar energy directly into electricity through. Yes. And that and that double verifies that we validates that we got rid of that definition. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everybody. That was that was Chris, thank you for being here. Thank you Stephanie also. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your insane <laughs> worth it. Work it. Like dedication <laughs> she looks relaxed i know she, she looks, looks different doesn't she <laughs> yeah she does she does i hope you're i hope you're sleeping late and reading a lot of good books i'm reading really good books i'm not sleeping late i'm very busy <laughs> that's Didn't great but thank you very much and i'm going to sign thank you. up yeah thank, thank you chris you. thank you let's just double check our our agenda um yes let's let's talk about university drive overlay you're oh, supposed to ask for public comment oh, thank you thank you pat <laughs> thank you pat we have two attendees would the attendees care to provide up to two minutes of additional comments at which point the um the crc would be um open to hearing We're reopening public comment period, specifically on the solar bylaw. And we probably put them to sleep. I don't see any hands. So I'm gonna close that session of noisy. public hearing. Noisy, noisy. And um, we're gonna go to University Drive overlay. <laughs> 